Hello all, thank you for joining. My name is Lindsay Johnson and I'm on the Uncommon Conversations team here at Worldwide Clinical Trials, which is a global full service contract research organization. We're striving to have uncommon conversations all over the world on a variety of drug development topics to bring you best practices, recommendations, and more. I'm here with two industry experts to serve as a moderator for a discussion on considerations for 505B2 development. Today, we're going to cover the latest trends and early planning recommendations for building and executing a successful 505B2 development program. Now let's meet our panelists. We have Sherilyn Adcock here from Worldwide Clinical Trials. Sherilyn, do you mind introducing yourself and speaking to us about your role at Worldwide? Thank you, Lindsay. Hello, this is Sherilyn Adcock. I'm the Executive Vice President in the Medical and Scientific Affairs Division at Worldwide Clinical Trials. I mainly support early phase services, our phase one clinical pharmacology unit and research pharmacy services in San Antonio, Texas, and the pharmacokinetic and bioanalytical services in Austin, Texas. I also work with business development and operations to transition clinical programs as they progress to the late stage development. I've been with Worldwide for over 20 years and in the industry for more than 30. I'm a pharmacist by education and training and hold master's and doctorate degrees with an emphasis in health research and biostatistics. As it pertains to the 505B2 programs, I am involved in protocol design and logistics to ensure that studies can be well executed and provide the data expected for agency filing. We work closely with our partners at Camargo to ensure study objectives and timelines are met. Across Worldwide and Camargo, we offer a full service solution for successful 505B2 filing. Great, thanks, Sherilyn. We also have Christy Norris from Camargo Pharmaceutical Services. Christy, can you tell us a little more about what you do at Camargo? My name is Christy Norris, and I'm a Director of Regulatory Strategy at Camargo Pharmaceutical Services. I came to Camargo with a background in academic science. Um, specifically, I have a PhD in biochemistry and molecular genetics and did a postdoc at Duke in the pharmacology and cancer biology department. I joined Camargo a little over seven and a half years ago. And in that time, I have partnered with a variety of sponsors to provide strategy, regulatory advice, and development solutions, particularly pertaining to the 505B2 pathway. At Camargo, we specialize in complex development programs like 505B2, those programs that require a customized or nuanced approach to regulatory and development strategy. At my time at Camargo, I have worked with various companies to build successful 505B2 development programs. I've represented sponsors in more than 40 FDA interactions across 10 different divisions of the CEDAR side of FDA. Thank you both for joining us today. Now we're just going to start right in with our first question. Can you begin by giving me a quick overview of what the 505B2 regulatory pathway is? How similar or different from other pathways is it? And has their popularity grown? Yes, so 505B2 is a hybrid pathway that falls in between the most likely more familiar pathways to the listeners of this webinar, 505B1 and 505J or generic development. So 505B1 pathway focuses mainly on new chemical or new molecular entities. These are novel compounds. And those submissions require a full application of data, a data package that predominantly is obtained from studies conducted by or for the sponsor and contain full evaluations of safety and effectiveness. The 505J or the generic product pathway is for products that are the same as other products that are already approved and involves demonstration of that similarity through a bioequivalence program. The 505B2 pathway falls in between in that it still requires full safety and effectiveness in the NDA package, but the source of the data for the safety and effectiveness 
can be derived from a variety of sources, including other approved products, so listed drugs, or published information in clinical or non-clinical literature. 505B2 drugs can be repurposed drugs, reformulations, or previously unapproved products that have been marketed. However, new chemical entities and new molecular entities can and have been approved under the 505B2 pathway as well. Speaking to the popularity of the pathway, 505B2 approvals have steadily increased over the past couple of decades. And even in the time that I've been with Camargo for the last seven years, they've increased pretty substantially. And today they make up more than half of all the NDA new drug approvals at FDA. And as Christy mentioned, 505B2 is really a hybrid. Some characteristics of an NDA, others of an ANDA, and as such has some unique characteristics of its own. And the requirements may vary depending on the compound under study and its known history. A product being developed and hopefully approved via the 505B2 pathway is not simply a generic version of a previously approved drug. It may be for a different indication or indications, a new population not included in the labeling of the reference product, or it may be a new and improved formulation for a current patient population, such as a longer acting once a day dose to improve patient compliance or offer a more favorable adverse event profile. Now, preclinical data, as Kiristi mentioned, single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose type studies conducted by the original NDA holder may be used to support the 505B2 application. If indeed there's reference product data available, it may be used by the sponsor of the 505B2 eligible product, and they will need to build a case for the comparison via a paper only or through clinical trials. Again, the requirements may vary from compound to compound. Therefore, this pathway offers an excellent option, saving time and resources for those manufacturers with a not entirely new molecular entity that offers a new indication, new dose form, a dosing regimen, strength, or a new combination with other compounds or even a device. My next question is, How common are 505B2 NDA approvals? How has the 505B2 development landscape changed in the past five to 10 years from both a regulatory strategy and study conduct perspective? Since 2017, Worldwide Early Phase has had over 200 505B2 designated opportunities enter the proposal feasibility review process. They have ranged from agency mandated preclinical bioanalytical work only to full clinical programs and everything in between. This represents a significant increase in interest in this approval approach over the past decade. Today, approximately 30% of our early phase work is for a 505B2 filing. Of particular note is that more generic companies that traditionally only pursued ANDA filings began showing an increased interest in the 505B2 approach after the generic patent cliff in around 2014. Also, drug manufacturers with a unique delivery platform began looking at ways to apply these innovative delivery systems to older drug products and obtain approval via the 505B2 pathway. We have found that each of these 505B2 programs seems to have its own unique characteristics, and the sponsor's approach, to a great degree, depends on the company's history and the development team's background. We see all types of companies considering this approach, from big pharma, mid-size, small pharma, generic, and even near-virtual companies. No matter what the company background and approach is, clinical conduct success is based on sound regulatory guidance. Camargo is highly experienced and capable in navigating these regulatory aspects. Worldwide works closely with Camargo to execute the required trials when paper-only submission is not an option. Camargo was founded to focus on the 505B2 regulatory pathway 17 years ago in 2003, which was just a few years after the FDA released a guidance on development of 505B2 products. Our founders, Ken Phelps and Ruth Stevens, were actually involved in the first private 505B2 NDA approval. Since that time, 505B2 approvals have steadily gained in number. As they've increased in number, there has been more regulatory precedent set. 
And this is helpful today for sponsors starting down the 505B2 regulatory pathway approach because the FDA has also gained familiarity and a level of comfort with the approaches used in 505B2. Generic manufacturers, as Sherilyn mentioned, have demonstrated an increased interest in the 505B2 pathway, as well as the blockbuster drugs are going off patent. The 505B2 pathway does not have the same requirement of sameness as ANDAs. From a clinical perspective, that means that in order to rely on information from an approved product in a 505B2 application, demonstration of bioequivalence is not required. Interesting. And let's talk benefits. What are the benefits of the 505B2 pathway? From the perspective of the sponsor, the benefits include reduced cost, reduced time, and a reduction in risk. Sponsors can also still achieve market exclusivity of three, five, or seven years using the 505B2 pathway. From the patient's perspective, benefits include greater flexibility through availability of different dosage forms or different dosing regimens, as Sherilyn alluded to earlier, to increase compliance and convenience. There's also the advantages or the potential advantages of enhanced safety profiles and in some cases, additional efficacy benefits for these 505B2 approved drugs. We have several examples that I can reference from the years that I've worked at Camargo related to sponsor and patient benefits of products approved under the 505B2 pathway. For instance, we've worked on several paper-only NDAs, which means that the sponsor did not conduct any non-clinical or clinical studies but used only available information in their NDA application for approval. These drugs that were approved as paper-only NDAs had a long history of clinical use, but the products that were being used had no formal FDA approval. By gaining approval for these products, sponsors were able to provide information in the approved product labeling to help inform physicians on areas such as dosing and treatment duration and provide a regulated product for both safe and effective treatment of the patient population. In addition to the paper-only NDA examples, we've also had sponsors that anticipated very large development programs more comparable to a 505B1 when they were initially interacting with the team at Camargo. However, through our experience and nuanced approach to 505B2, we've been able to help sponsors lay out innovative strategies to get more streamlined programs, often PK-only programs, to save the sponsor significant time and development costs, and also allow the product to reach the patients faster. In our experience with FDA, they are open to innovative approaches under 505B2, and they're willing to collaborate with sponsors, especially when it means getting a better treatment with proven safety and efficacy to the right patients faster. Clearly, one of the biggest benefits for our clients is the clinical studies and safety efficacy clinical testing. It may take a good deal of time and effort to complete the literature searches and compile the information, but this far outweighs the cost and time to repeat studies when the agency will allow this historical data to support your 505B2 submission. In some cases, historical non-U.S. generated data may be utilized to support the 505B2 filing. And there is the benefit of relatively low risk of failure due to the previous drug approval, with the caveats being that your formulation behaves as expected and the agency recommendations from the pre-IND meeting are followed and appropriately documented and presented in the submission. Christy has mentioned the potential for market exclusivity, thus alleviating competitive forces. Finally, with respect to benefits, there are several types of products that might benefit from the 505B2 pathway. These include branded generics, DESI drugs, pro-drugs, the pro-drugs we have seen more and more in the recent years, orphan drugs, and drug device combinations. 
If a sponsor does choose the 505 B2 pathway, what key recommendations do you find yourself repeating to sponsors when they come to you for regulatory help? At Camargo, we highly encourage early and frequent communication with FDA. And by early, I mean starting with the pre-IND meeting. A successful pre-IND meeting, as defined by Camargo, is that the sponsor leaves the meeting or the interaction with the FDA with a clear path forward. At Camargo, we take a unique approach to pre-INDs because of the nuances and the flexibility of the 505B2 program. We focus on outlining the whole program and include detailed discussion with the agency on the sources of information to support the NDA application as well as the bridging strategy, which is critical to establish reliance on those various sources of information. We take into account the final labeling and both the commercial and marketing goals of the sponsor to strike a balance between product differentiation and speed to market to provide 505B2 approved products that are valuable in the marketplace to both physicians and patients. And what kind of timelines are we looking at for the 505B2 pathway? How does the sponsor plan and evaluate the full program scope to avoid pitfalls? So really you begin by building off that successful pre-IND meeting where you have a path forward to approval. As we have discussed earlier, there is a spectrum of 505B2s from the paper only where no clinical or non-clinical studies are conducted by the sponsor to programs that look more like generic development and are phase one only and might just include comparative bioavailability or bioequivalence studies to a listed drug. There's also programs that might have either a large non-clinical and small clinical component or vice versa, all the way up to programs that are more similar in both size and scope to a new chemical entity slash 505B1 type program that might involve multiple randomized controlled trials. So along with the spectrum of information that might be required for the sponsor to put together, there is also a spectrum in terms of timing. A paper only program might just involve a single FDA meeting As a pre-IND, but focused more like a pre-NDA meeting, there's additional time to gather the information and submit, as well as the PDUFA timelines. But you're looking at much faster, you know, year, two years to market versus the programs where clinical is required. And then you're looking at longer, but still truncated compared to the typical 505B1 development pathway. Worldwide Early Phase Services provides the design expertise and the execution for those 505B2 programs that fall into the Phase 1 category, pharmacokinetic, safety, tolerability, bioequivalence type comparisons. It is advisable to start early, as Christy has indicated, once the initial regulatory strategy discussions that have established that a paper-only approach is not an option. Have a plan and good understanding of who your potential partners will be early in the process and seek their advice from their past experience. When we've been asked by potential sponsors what is most important to them, the response we most often hear is a bioanalytical lab, that has experience with the compound and a clinical pharmacology unit that has experience with the drug or similar compounds in the class. This is especially true if the compound has a challenging adverse event profile. Bioanalytical startup for the PK analysis can take four to eight weeks depending on the need for method validation in a suitable range and that should be completed in advance of the first dose date in the clinic. Clinical startup it can be in the four to six week range once study designs are established and protocols are finalized. It is important to reserve clinic dates early to ensure space availability as close as possible to drug availability. It's also highly advisable to consider conducting a pilot study with new formulations. In some cases, we have had sponsors choose to compare two or three prototype formulations and or dosing 
dosing regimens to the reference compound to determine which formulation or dosing regimen best fits the profile they need for a successful submission. Although this approach may extend the timeline to some degree, it offers a potential for a higher degree of success in the pivotal trials. Great. And who are the players here? What partnerships are most essential to successful study completion? And how do you activate these key players to be involved at the right time? One key player in the development of any product, but particularly with 505B2, is the FDA. Partnership with the FDA, particularly early on, but also throughout development, is critical to understanding how the agency is going to view the various sources of information presented in a 505B2 NDA. It's also important to engage experts in 505B2 development strategy that understand the nuances and are experienced in working with FDA to optimize the program and to maximize the success rate for the product. One of the key elements of understanding how to best leverage an interaction, particularly a pre-IND with FDA, is having experts that are experienced across various divisions. FDA has become more familiar with 505B2 over the previous several decades, but there are definitely differences between how 505B2 applications are viewed within the different divisions of CEDAR. So having an expert partner that is able to navigate those nuances and works closely with various divisions at FDA is also very critical for success. Partnerships with CROs with specific B2 experience, like worldwide clinical trials, is also key for success. I was looking at the players from a different perspective. I was looking at the players as our clients. We see clients from all aspects of drug development looking for 505B2 pathway opportunities. Large, medium, small companies looking to expand their portfolio, as we discussed previously. Virtual companies, maybe even with less than five employees. Others a little larger, but all the employees are contract consultants. Or even two men in a garage with a drug and an idea. We see them all. Also, more generic companies showing interest in the 505B2 approach, especially in the past decade. The one group that does not play in the space is biosimilars. 505B2 is not a pathway for these compounds. There's no simple guidance or simple or even complex checklist that provides a clear path for 505B2 approvals, but that does not mean this approach should be avoided. There are too many benefits to be gained by pursuing this approach. As Christy and I have emphasized, early engagement with the agency with experts to help you navigate the most efficient and cost-effective pathway is the key to success. Good point. Each 505B2 is truly unique. So Christy, what role does Camargo play in 505B2 development for sponsors? What services do you provide? Camargo provides end-to-end strategic and regulatory solutions to support sponsors all the way from early development through approval or commercialization. The types of projects that we work on with sponsors spans the gamut from candidate assessment or feasibility from a scientific, regulatory, medical, or commercial standpoint, through pre-IND and other FDA meetings and interactions. We also support sponsors with their applications, including INDs and NDAs, as well as various aspects of non-clinical, clinical, and CMC support throughout the timeline of drug development. And Sherilyn, what are the tools that Worldwide provides to clients when sponsors are looking to transition from regulatory planning to clinical study conduct? How do Worldwide services help sponsors reduce anxiety and manage the unknowns? Three common concerns for any clinical trial are the need for quality data, meeting timelines, and costs. This is no different for the 505B2 programs. The importance of high quality data that meets regulatory mandates is absolutely critical. Timely execution of the trial, efficient startup, no recruitment delays, on-time database locker is equally as important. Cost is also a factor, but the best value does not always translate to the lowest cost. Clearly, all these are important considerations in clinical research, and the ranking of their importance of these factors depends on the stakeholder. Worldwide can offer aggressive, achievable timelines 
with respect to protocol writing, IRB approvals, study participant identification, screening, and enrollment. Worldwide can also offer a seamless package of clinical, bioanalytical, pharmacokinetic, and report services. Additionally, ClinSpark, an electronic data capture system utilized at the Clinical Pharmacology Unit in San Antonio, can offer real-time review remotely of the clinical data and an expedited database lock when needed. Just as with all NDA projects, an experienced project manager is assigned to drive the project from startup to final deliverable. The Clinical Pharmacology Unit in San Antonio includes a state-of-the-art diagnostic laboratory and can handle all routine clinical laboratory testing with rapid results turnaround time. There's also a full-service pharmacy on-site to manage routine drug accountability and dispensation and also offers enhanced CGMP for Phase 1 capability to assist with formulation development such as suspensions or capsule filling, as well as planning and implementing specific dosing procedures as needed. Excellent. And for my last set of questions, if people want to find out more about the services Camargo can provide, what can they do? Lindsay, I would encourage them to visit our website, camargopharma.com, or to send us an email at services at camargopharma.com to schedule an introductory call with our commercial team. And if people want to find out more about the services Worldwide can provide? You can certainly get in touch with our experts to discuss how Worldwide can help with your 505B2 program needs or contact us through worldwide.com. Camargo and Worldwide offer a winning team of regulatory strategists and clinical and bioanalytical experts to support your efforts toward a successful 505B2 filing. Thank you, Christy, for joining our discussion, and thank you, Lindsay, for leading it. Of course. Thank you both for joining me today. And for those watching at home, what do you want to discuss next here at Uncommon Conversations and Drug Development Trends? Email me at lindsay.johnson at worldwide.com with topic suggestions.